Hey there, this is Sean McMahon. Thanks so much for listening to my podcast and thanks for supporting the ministry by lending your ears, your minds, hearts, all that good stuff. Don't be afraid to share this here message with a friend or a family member, even a stranger. Have at. It's not like it's going to bite. These messages are recorded live at the Community Baptist Church of Gayhead in Aquinnah on Martha's Vineyard, Massachusetts, and the good old U.S. of A. If you're ever in town for a visit or suddenly find yourself shipwrecked on the southwest side of our lovely little island, climb up the clay cliffs and come on down to our little old chapel for our weekly 10 a.m. service. No need to wear anything special, just bring your special self. Mm -hmm. May God bless you. Today's scripture reading is taken from the book of Revelation, chapter 15, verses 1 through 3. Then I saw another great marvelous sign in heaven, seven angels with the seven final plagues, which, with which the wrath of God is completed. And I saw something like a sea of glass mixed with fire, beside which stood those who had conquered the beast and its image and the number of its name. They were holding harps from God, and they sang the song of God's servant Moses and of the Lamb. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Now today we're going to talk about Tisha B'Av. It's called Tisha B'Av. And it's a Jewish day of mourning. It's a holy day. Um, and it's a day of mourning. I didn't learn about it until I was uh, in my 20s, when I was a young adult, when I was living uh, with a Hasidic Jewish community in Brooklyn, which I had so many good stories about. It was a good time. Um, and I observed Tisha B'Av with them I think two years, possibly three years in a row. And what you do is you fast, uh, you don't drink, because sometimes when you break a fast uh, in the Jewish community, you can drink at night, but can't do that. You don't fast, you don't drink. You're not supposed to wear leather on the soles of your shoes. And in the modern days, that means you also don't wear leather in your clothes. And you also don't read any Torah. You don't read any Bible, except for the sad parts. You can only read the sad parts. And some communities won't even read any Torah, okay? So what does Tisha B'Av mean? It's, it's a Jewish Hebrew word, and it means the ninth of Av. Av is a month in the Jewish calendar. So Tisha B'Av, ninth of Av, it's a date. It's a date. Just like we say the 4th of July, but a very different kind of date. It's a very unfortunate date. It's a very unlucky date, they say, because it's a date on which not one, not two, but several tragedies happened to the Jewish nation throughout its ancient history. Same date, different years, sometimes separated by hundreds of years. How's that for an anomaly? It's wild, right? In the days of Moses, spies went out to the promised land and they came back to the Hebrew people in the desert with discouraging news. And they said, there'll be giants over there. They said, there's giants and we're never going to be able to defeat them. And, uh, the people became afraid when they heard this, this news and, and they were, they lost hope. They lost hope in God. They didn't trust God to give them victory when they get to the promised land. And so they said, maybe, you know, maybe we should turn back. And God wasn't too darn pleased about that. And so God punishes them in the story with 40 years of wandering in the desert. And they suffered greatly during this time. Well, this happened on Tisha B'Av. That happened on Tisha B'Av. Many years later, Jeremiah, the prophet, warned the people of Israel that if they don't repent from their sins in the land, they'll become enslaved again, uh, but not to Egypt, but to another nation, and their holy temple will be destroyed. Well, in the 5th century BC, the Babylonians came, and they sacked Jerusalem. You know that story, right? By the rivers of Babylon, where we sat down and wept because they pillaged Zion and the temple built by Solomon, the son of David, that was destroyed and all of its treasures were stolen and carried off and the people of Israel themselves were carried off as prisoners. This happened on Tisha B'Av, same date. Now the prophet Jeremiah, who warned about this, he said, don't worry, this captivity is going to last 70 years. He said 70 years, there's 70 years to uh, get things right, 70 years. Um, and when the 70 years has passed, you may have remembered this from the book of Daniel. Daniel, the prophet, says, okay, God, here I am in Babylon. Uh, it's been 70 years. Jeremiah said that we'd be set free now. 
When are we going to get set back to our home? When are we going to get to rebuild our holy city? When are we going to get our temple back? When can we rebuild that? And an angel comes and answers Daniel's prayers, and Daniel sees these wild visions in the night. Well, he's told King Cyrus is going to release the Hebrew captives at the promised time. It's going to happen very soon. And soon after that, Jerusalem and her temple, they're going to start to be rebuilt. But the angel gives Daniel a warning. And he says that um, from the time that the work of the rebuilding is commanded, he says, your people have 70 weeks of years. 70 weeks of years, 490 years. Think about how specific this is. Says, you, your people have 490 years for your people and for your holy city to stop their transgressions, okay? To put an end to sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Okay, And he says at the time of the final week of seven years, at the 70th week, this angel tells Daniel, then your Messiah will come. The one you're waiting for will come in that final week. But he's going to be cut off. He's going to be killed. Okay, And after these things, this angel tells Daniel, then the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and sanctuary. Does that sound familiar? This has just happened to them. He's being told it's going to happen again when Messiah comes. He says, then the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end will come like a flood. And until the end, there will be war and desolations have been decreed. And there shall be in the temple the abomination of desolation. And the desolation shall continue even until the consummation and the end. Okay. And guess what? Everything turned out just like the angel said to Daniel. The city and the temple are rebuilt. And almost 500 years later, Jesus Christ comes. Jesus Christ comes. And he himself reminds the people of Judea about what Daniel was told 500 years before. He says, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, when you see the abomination of desolation described by the prophet Daniel, then let everyone in Judea flee to the mountains because Jerusalem's destruction is near, right? And it was exactly so. And the the first ever historian of the church is a man named Eusebius uh, in the third century and fourth century. And he says, when the Romans invaded at that time, Eusebius says, at last the abomination of desolation proclaimed by the prophets stood in the very temple of God, so celebrated of old, the temple which awaited its total and final destruction by fire. This happened in the first century. Not just the temple, but the entire city were destroyed as foretold just 40 years after Christ, okay? Now, those who believed Christ and the prophets who warned about this and who survived all the wars leading up to that day, they escaped Judea and they did flee to the mountains. And and, and the people who did not, they were not so lucky. The carnage was unlike anything anyone had ever seen before. Historians say that the city was literally, literally filled with rivers of blood and fire up to people's knees. The streets of Jerusalem were filled with rivers of blood and fire everywhere. And the smoke of the fires blotted out the sun and the temple at the heart of the city fell to the ground, never to be rebuilt again, just as God foretold. That happened on Tisha B'Av on the same day, okay? Tisha B'Av is a traumatic memory for all Jews, especially that last Tisha B'Av. 2,000 years ago, that destroyed the second temple, that that ended the Levitical priesthood forever. That was the government of the Jewish nation, okay? It was the end of Jewish life as they'd known it since the beginning of the days of Moses, right? Well, imagine if, if our nation and its government and its laws and its capital were destroyed forever, right? Would we continue being Americans for thousands of years, no matter where we were carried off, no matter how much changed, no matter how much we were scattered throughout the world? Would we try to live according to American laws um, in the absence of a homeland, in the absence of a functioning government? Right? That's what it has meant to live a Jewish life since Tisha B'Av, since that awful traumatic event that happened almost 2,000 years ago, okay? So here is a very difficult fact about this. This is a traumatic event for the Jewish people, but for the earliest Christians, Tisha B'Av was considered a triumph, a triumph by the earliest Christians, okay? And it sounds odd, and I think it even sounds horrifying after that description of what happened. It was a Holocaust, what happened, it was horrible. 
Okay? But understanding why the first Christians considered a triumph is important for us to understand who Jesus is and who Jesus wants us to be. And it's surprising. So let's try to understand it. And there are three important points to understand about this. First, for the first Christians, Tisha B'Av was proof that Jesus was a real prophet, a true prophet. And far from C.S. Lewis saying that Christ's predictions on the Mount of Olives were an embarrassment, Eusebius, the first century historian, the third century historian, he talks about these wars that led to Tisha B'Av and said, if anyone compares the words of our Savior, Jesus Christ, with the accounts of these wars, how can one fail to wonder and to admit that the foreknowledge and the prophecy of our Savior were truly divine and marvelous and strange, right? And Eusebius goes on to explain to his Roman audience who had never heard of this stuff before. He said, well, Christ predicted this in Matthew 24, in Mark 13, in Luke 21. So these awful things that Christ foretold, they weren't just random calamities, okay? They weren't random. They were curses. They were curses, which the prophets had warned about for many generations, all the way back to Moses himself. So not only Christ's credibility, but the credibility of all the prophets who had ever come was on the line in the first century, all the way back to Moses. That's the second important point. Remember in Deuteronomy, when God says, I'm going to send you prophets. If what they say doesn't come to pass, they're not true prophets. So don't believe them. Don't be afraid of them. So the, the credibility of all the prophets that are in the Bible was on the line at the time of Christ, okay? Before his death, Moses sings a song of warning about this very event to his people. It's recorded in Deuteronomy 32. And he warns them that these things would be visited on the nation one day to punish their disobedience. And this would be the day of Christ, okay? Well, John the Revelator mentions this song. He calls it the Song of Moses in his Revelation. In chapter 15, he sees seven angels with seven plagues with which the wrath of God is finished. And they were singing the Song of Moses. Okay? Well, the wrath which they were given to pour out on the land is that wrath that was poured out on Jerusalem, on Tisha B'Av. And Eusebius, our, our church historian, he says that John's vision of this imminent disaster was instrumental in saving the Christians from it. He says that the people of the church in Jerusalem had been commanded by the revelation um, to leave the city and dwell in a certain town, and that town was called Pella. It was in the hills, it was in the mountains, and when those that believed in Christ had left Jerusalem, only then, as if the royal city of the Jews and the whole land of Judea were entirely destitute of holy men, the judgment of God at length overtook those who had committed such outrages against Christ and his apostles, who they killed, and totally destroyed that generation of impious men. That's what the church historian says. So he's talking about like it's a good thing. It's a horrible thing, but he's saying God is judging the people who killed Christ and his apostles. Well, this is exactly what Jesus Christ had said. He warned his fellow countrymen that all of the righteous blood that's been shed on earth from the blood of righteous Abel, the son of Adam, to the blood of Zechariah, one of our priests, you know, one of his priests in that day. He said, truly, I tell you, this is all going to come upon your generation. Okay, so Eusebius writes that the earlier uh, historian, a Jewish historian named Josephus, has this whole history he wrote about the things that happened to Jerusalem in that time leading up to Tisha B'Av. And he says that these accounts demonstrate the true predictions of our Savior in which he foretold these very events who by divine power saw them beforehand as if they were already present and he wept and mourned just like the evangelist says in the gospel says jesus weeps weeps over jerusalem seeing what's about to happen to them and these events were indeed very mournful they were terrible they were awful but for the christians they signified the faithfulness of god Eusebius says that they proved that God was not long in executing vengeance upon them for their wickedness against the Christ of God and his people. Okay? So the first Christians saw Tisha B'Av as the justice of God, the wrath of God, poured out on the enemies of Christ as foretold by the prophets. Now this is important for us. Why? Because if we go back to the words of John the Revelator, the Holy Spirit tells us that these disasters on Tisha B'Av are final plagues with which the wrath of God is finished, okay? This is the third important point about Tisha B'Av. It shows 
that the wrath of God was finished with that, finished with that. Neither should any Christian expect or hope the wrath of God to come down on his children or any of his enemies ever again, okay? The words of scripture are final on the matter. The plagues, Tisha B'av, the wrath of God is finished, finished. The wrath of God is finished. This is why the first Christians rejoiced at Tisha B'av, because God would never again bring such a wrath upon his own people, right? Tisha B'av was the fulfillment of the Song of Moses, remember, the Song of Moses, these ancient warnings that the kingdom would be taken away from disobedient sinners, right? In the old covenant of Moses, sin had to be punished and things had to be taken away if you sin. But in the new covenant of Jesus, what happens if you sin? You're forgiven. You're offered forgiveness. And so the song of the lamb, right, is not about a kingdom under wrath that can be taken away from condemned sinners, but it's an everlasting kingdom under grace that will never be taken from sinners, never be taken from even sinners. Repentant sinners are Christians. They're called saints. They're sinners. We're all sinners, but we're called saints because it's a kingdom of mercy. It's a kingdom of forgiveness. It's a kingdom of grace, and it's a kingdom of grace and not a kingdom of wrath, okay? And the first Christians had this confidence because the law which condemned them, the law of Moses, whose curse they were under, that was finally put away at Tisha B'Av. I know that sounds wild and almost awful, right? But that law that was so beloved by the people at that time, the Jews, that was the law that was condemning them. That was the law that was putting the wrath of God on them because they had been disobedient to them. On Tisha B'Av, that was put away. The priesthood of Moses' brother Aaron was forever done away with from that day because there was no longer a temple to perform all the, all the sacrifices at anymore, right? It became impossible, it remains impossible still, and therefore unnecessary to be obedient to the law of Moses without its temple or priesthood. You cannot fulfill the law of Moses to this day. I was very familiar with this in the Jewish community. You, you cannot fulfill all 613 commandments of the law without that temple, without that priesthood. And St. Paul taught extensively about this. He said, when the priesthood is changed, there's a change of the law. And that's just the way it is. Okay, well, what changed? The priesthood that changed was Christ's priesthood. The law that changed was Christ's royal law, right? The golden rule. That's all he taught. Christ taught a very simple rule. This was God's will, according to the testimony of the prophets, all the way up to Christ himself. And it's explained in detail in the Bible by the epistle writers in the Bible. This is a very difficult thing for our Jewish brothers and sisters. I'm Jewish. I'm Jewish. No one ever pitched this explanation to me when I was still practicing Jewish. I sort of learned it for myself later once I was already a believer. But if anyone had tried to explain it to me while I was still practicing Judaism, I think I would have been terribly offended. It's an awful thing to hear. It's kind of ludicrous. And I don't think I would have wanted to believe it. Uh, It's frankly a little difficult to understand as well. Uh, St. Peter said that his friend St. Paul's explanations in the Bible about this whole topic, he said, it's kind of difficult to understand. St. Peter's like, yo, Paul's a little too deep on this stuff. It's very hard to understand. But it's important for Christians to understand what our first generation Christian ancestors believed on this matter, okay? Because one, it's the loss of this memory that's led some Christians to demonize our Jewish brothers and sisters, even now, even in our day, right? As if they're still somehow guilty of Christ's blood. I know someone very close to me who was nearly lynched for being Jewish because he was a Christ killer, right? This still happens. It's nonsense and it needs to stop. Awful things have been done to Jews and continue to be done to them in the name of Christ because of this bogus belief that they're still somehow guilty as if they haven't been punished, right? Scripture is clear. There's only one generation guilty of Christ's blood, and that is the people who actually put him to death, the people who actually put him to death, strung him up on the cross, the people who actually killed his apostles. And they were punished for a long time ago, and that was the final punishment, and that's why the wrath of God was finished, right? It's an important thing for us to remember for other reasons too, because many Christians, right, as well as non-believers, as well as skeptics, right? Um, They struggle with reconciling what they consider to be a schizophrenic God. Before I was a believer, I did, because there's this love God of Jesus. God is love, right? We all love him. And he's on the one hand. On the other hand, there's the wrath God. 
There's a wrath God of Moses and of Revelation where there's rivers of blood. And terrifying stuff, right? Well, Jesus came preaching love. He did. But he also dished out some heavy-handed warnings to everyone, anyone who didn't obey this preaching about love. But he was clear. Here's the thing. He was clear about who those warnings applied to. As were the prophets who came before him. This wicked generation upon which all these things will be visited, all the blood from Abel to Zechariah is going to come upon the people who killed Jesus Christ. Okay, that generation. So his Song of Moses warnings were for a particular people. The Song of Moses was for a particular people, a particular place, a particular time. But the Song of the Lamb, that's a promise that's everlasting. That's this promise that's everlasting. Christ came to change the world forever, once and for all. And he did. He did when he came. And those old warnings don't apply to us. They don't apply to you. They don't apply to anyone. The old warnings of the Song of Moses were not under the covenant of Moses. Don't see it anywhere. There's no temple administering that covenant. It's not how it works. This was God's plan, okay? The old warnings don't apply because they were the curse of a covenant which no longer stands. And it no longer stands because it was decisively finished on Tisha B'Av. The wrath of God was finished on Tisha B'Av. Paul said that this old covenant was shakable. It was created, okay? It was shakable and it would not remain when God shook the heavens and the earth, but only unshakable things would remain. Namely, he's talking about the kingdom of God. If we see the old covenant no longer in effect, and God is true, then we can see that clearly he shook the heavens and the earth in the manner that St. Paul described, because that covenant, which he said was shakable and was going to be shaken, is no longer here. Okay, so it's equally true that because the kingdom of God remains, it is not shaken, it is not shaken in any way because it's not shakable, and therefore St. Paul is also true. It will never be shaken. It will be here for good. It stands forever, as the prophet said, and as Christ said, it's within you. Okay? So let's have confidence as Christians that the church which Christ founded and said that even the gates of hell wouldn't prevail against, this is our unshakable eternal kingdom. And God is never going to pour out wrath against us as he did on that one final generation of Tisha B'Av. And as Paul said in 1 Corinthians 3.16, we ourselves are God's temple. God's never going to tear this temple down. Okay, And we learn this from Tisha B'Av. We learn this from Tisha B'Av. And we also learn that we got to stand firm, okay? That charging anyone today with the guilt of blood, of the, of the blood of Christ, Jewish or otherwise, it's unfounded. It's kind of crazy. It's irrational. It's perverse. It's not a scriptural teaching. And it charges Christ with being a false prophet, too, as if he shed his blood in vain and the things he came for haven't been accomplished, right? But the blood of Christ is precious, Okay, and it was poured out for everyone, once and for all, that the world may be reconciled to God and be at peace with him and one another in his body. On Tisha B'Av, we want to remember with what great cost this peace with, was purchased with and enter into this peace with humble thanksgiving to our God who accomplished all this for us long ago. Amen. Amen. Thank you for listening to the Sean McMahon Podcast. Visit SeanSellickMcMahon.com for more information about his ministry. For more about Sean's music, please visit WorkmanSong.com.